I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. There's something I wondered about as I was talking with everyone I met. How do they find people to work with or stuff to display? Do they make it all themselves? Do they find people and say, I want to present your stuff? I learned about how they open their places, but how can others get involved and possibly show their work there? So the question I ask this week is, how do you find the creators and the work you display? When I was asking this question, it also made me think about things like, how should I price things that I make? I can never figure that one out. My current method is guessing. I could search online and see if there's a creative generator or something, which now that I think of it, I should really look at that. That would be funny. So here are the answers that the people that I spoke with had for me. And now let's start with the Yellow Rose Gallery. By becoming a member of the Yellow Rose Gallery, an artist would get to host events and showcase their work. We have a membership model for the nonprofit. So the artists pay a monthly fee to host art in the gallery and then they make money by making sales. How do the artists find out about it? I think about? it's almost entirely been by word of mouth. Though we do have a website and a Facebook page and an email address, and I think some people have reached out to us, but I think most people were referred in okay. some way. But we'd encourage um, any interested artists okay. to, to showcase their works here. There's no decision as to like, well, and then this is a percentage. Again, this is me not knowing nonprofits, so I'm just mm -hmm. trying to figure out how this works. Is it just put up your stuff and whatever your price is, that's, that's cool? Yeah. I think so, okay. yeah. Exactly, yeah. I don't have pieces up in here of $500, $700, even more in some some pieces like $15 to $20. It ranges between those numbers. Nothing too extremely high, um, but again, is where people can't come in here and if they, uh, they can afford it, you know, at, at any range. Tammy from Bohemian Bobble does the pop-ups with people she knows. So how does she set up what will happen with everyone who's involved? I would say it really depends on the situation. What I have done with groups, if the establishment does not charge anything, but we want to get flyers printed, mm -hmm. we'll all share equally in the expense of the paper flyers. Mm -hmm. So it's not coming out of one person's pocket. And if the establishment does charge a fee, then you're looking more at one person being the organizer and maybe having to take a space fee from everybody so that they can pay the establishment. So it's kind of a short run business, like, all right, you be the yeah. treasurer, you be... Kind of, yeah. Everybody wears a lot of hats, too. It's kind of fun. And some of them who actually sell, might sell hats <laughs> might wear a lot of hats. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought of that. How do you determine your own labor? It's probably one of the harder things that, that people who make handmade things have to figure out, and it's really trial and error. It is very tricky because it depends on how successful do you want to be. Do you want to be able to keep doing what you're doing? Yeah. But you also have to price your things at a fee that people can afford it and will keep coming back. And jewelry is an odd thing because jewelry is known to be very expensive depending. It's also meant to be very accessible depending. It's kind of like the same thing with the music industry. iTunes determined songs are worth 99 cents. But albums, whatever the hell you want to charge. Yeah, everybody does what they want because they can. That is true. You can charge what you want. It's your work. It's your decision in the end. If I remember correctly, Wu-Tang Clan, I think, released an album once for like a million dollars or something, but it was because it was like one printed copy of it. Well, that and they're also Wu-Tang Clan, so I'm not sure if this really makes my point, but still. Mia from Stone Fence was the next person I talked to. She sells artwork on commission, or sometimes she'll buy the items outright. But the amount of space she has is also a factor when she's thinking about taking on new artists. Some of it I will buy outright, like the jewelry. It depends on the on whether they're willing to do that also, but I take a percentage. They get the majority of it because I don't have to subside on commission only. I have items with full markup, so I have other ways to pay the rent other than that. Um, I probably take a little smaller percentage than other places do, which I feel good about because I feel like the artist should have a chance to really 
sell their art and recoup most of it. Do you decide how many to take at a time? I mean, how do you factor in, like, oh, this Space, but it depends on how much wall space I have. I have a bad habit of not letting go of artists, and I, I keep peace from each artist, and so all of a sudden I'll look around and go, oh, I don't have any wall space left. Okay. If it's not someone else's artwork, obviously they decide the price. I will let them know if I think it's too high and won't sell at that price, but it's just my opinion. They don't need to follow it. Other things, there's a standard markup. I don't use a high markup. I just kind of do what I need to recoup and make a little bit for myself because I, I hate going into a store and looking at something overpriced, and, and that's, right. that's not what I want to be here. I don't want people to come in and have sticker shock. If you recall, 11000 also has a membership process. But for Sarah, it's also about connecting with the members and helping them with what they do. She also tries to match people together with relevant workshops that they host themselves. The membership is a really important part of our business model because to me it shows that people are willing to invest in this idea. And when they do that, then I'm also willing to invest in them. And I've learned that a lot of membership happens because of one-on-one -on -one connection. Like, I really want to know people. I think as we grow, I won't be essential to the business model, but right now it really means a lot to me to be able to have coffee with somebody and hear their story and understand their product and understand where they're coming from because then it helps me understand what types of experiences that I can help introduce them to to help them build their brand or I understand how to tell their story or talk about them. Also, like people... They want to be seen and they want to be heard, and I think a lot of artists feel really isolated. Bringing people in that way, I think, is a really... Um, we try to make people feel welcome and nurtured, and so membership is where we all start. And then once we know people, once I know people, then we develop matches and opportunities. So, like, creative workshops are meant for people who do want to teach side income. We usually split revenue 50-50 when we create an event together, and so we develop a price together that feels fair on both sides. And I always, like, you'll find that our workshops are priced higher than different places in town. There aren't really as many places offering the same types of things that we're doing, so it's a little different of a comparison. But the main reason is because I, I think it's important that if we want to value these types of creative people in our community, that we pay them living wages and that we pay them fairly for their expertise. So that, for me, is a huge part of our decision making and how we price things. And then we also do a lot of other pop-up events, like Good Day Market is one of our biggest events of the year. It's coming up in December. We feature about 40 to 50. Right now it's 40 to 50, but hopefully we'll keep growing it. I set booth fees based on how we can make uh, cover our cost, but also make a little bit of revenue to support the business model. And we don't take any fees from that, but we choose to we choose to cover our expenses through booth fees for that. We're always striving to be the in-betweener. We're not a place where you're coming for like creative entertainment and we're not a tech school. So we're in between. We're for the homesteaders, the people who want to live a handcrafted lifestyle. They maybe eat really good food, they cook, they want to dabble and like they love the the process of making things. Mm -hmm. So we're not like high end price, but we're not drop by and we're not mm -hmm. the entertainment side, which all has a place. It's just mm -hmm. where are the people who want to like spend three or four hours doing something or they have skills because they went to college and learned something or they're self taught and they want to make meaningful income from that. So in terms of figuring out pricing, take into account people's expertise that they bring. It just depends on the revenue stream. The products that you offer online, how do you come up with the price yeah. of those? And this is a question that comes up that we wrestle with all the time within the group because everybody's products are different and it's the constant question. Mm -hmm. and, it, and especially like when you're on Etsy or online and you start to see people selling things for a lot less. Undervaluing your work really is a detriment to the entire community when you mm -hmm. do that. Oftentimes when we talk about pricing, and when I think about pricing, if we're just talking about a product, it's obviously your cost of raw good, raw materials and goods. Mm -hmm. And then taking into account some of your overhead. Overhead could be if you have to rent studio space, if you have to pay taxes, if you have utilities, like all the overhead that you might pay in an entire year should be considered some sort of expense when you're thinking about pricing cost of labor, whether that's your labor or somebody else's labor, 
And then you should also think about profit, which a lot of people think labor is your profit, and it's not. If labor is your profit, then you're an hourly worker for yourself, and is that why you are creating this? And then also just thinking about whether or not you're going to wholesale will decide what your retail price should be. So if you want somebody else to carry your goods for a cut of the cost, then you should be setting your price, like doubling your price so that you can accommodate wholesale orders. In general, like in consumer behavior, especially if you're in the art or handmade category, they're gonna be suspicious of the lowest price stuff. Having things that are moderately or higher priced are actually better for you in a lot of ways because you're implying value exists Mm -hmm. and you're doing good things for the entire community and genre by placing appropriate value so that people understand what it takes to make things. And it's like, do you want to sell 100 things for $10 or would you, you know, like you want to work less and maybe sell less, but you make more, the same amount of money by pricing higher? Like that's just smart. Uh, Martha, she's been woodworking for 30 years. She does custom dining tables. She just did an entire bedroom set for somebody. But you might purchase a bedroom set once in your lifetime. That's a very expensive. You're not going to decide to spend $6,000 or something like at a market. But you might be willing to spend $50 to $100 on a cutting board yeah, or like a really cool trivet or a really cool rolling pin. So those are really great items that she carries that builds an audience for her and and builds resi- you know different types of income coming in from different sources hmm. and then maybe she lands like the really great furniture gig from that later hmm. but a range of prices I think is is nice for any sort of artist or maker and I love the fact that you were just able to reference a cutting board and a rolling pin in an example I just, <laughs> you don't hear that often Anthology still does some consignment work, but Laura said that her and her sister started producing a majority of the items themselves. And running your place also seems like it's an advantage to being able to test out your own creations. The way I took it was you try out new stuff, see what resonates with people, and what you should focus on. You know, we still do have some consignment, and it's it's pretty much a 50-50 split. There's always like a little bit of wiggle room mostly in favor of the store, to Mm -hmm. be honest. But I was coming from a retail background, Mm -hmm. and in retail, it's the store is usually getting closer to 60% than 50%. So I was coming from that. We do people submit work they send us emails and you know do that we we knew some i think we we were like a little hooked up into the craft circuit so you know we knew some artists and some people who were some of our like original stockists we just take in whatever they have. And actually my sister and I are, we're also consignees. So we were at that same level. Of curiosity, how mm-hmm. do you, how do you price consignment items in general? Like what's the concept? Sell well, the thing. artist has to have, I mean, they have to say what they need to cover the cost. There's a little bit of back and forth. So obviously if someone comes in and they say this, note card is going to cost $20, then I would say, well, most of our note cards cost $5. Sometimes someone brings something in and you're just like, I'm sorry, it's not a good fit for what we have. Okay. You know, I can tell from the history of what I've sold that I can't sell a note card for $20. With the stuff that you make on your own, with, mm-hmm. since you do most of that here. Yeah. Same question applies there. How do yeah. you decide what it's going to cost? You know, you always have some, like, you put something out and it's not selling at all, then sometimes you're like, yep, that's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like from from the artist's perspective, you just have to be really vigilant about what your costs are, and you don't do the, I'm just doing this for fun. <laughs> I just right. want to be able to afford a cup of coffee. You really have to look at what does it cost you to run your electricity for the day that you're doing all of this work. All of those costs, the space that you're using, the materials and of course your time because a lot of people just do their materials and just don't think about their time at all you have to balance all of that out and we have like i feel like as an artist i have a range of things that i can i'm capable of making i have things that i like to make and within that range there are things that i can sell 10 of and then there's things that i can only sell one of and so some of it is just like making that choice balancing out what you can sell there's always things that are you just whip them up quickly and they don't cost a lot but the 
person who's just casually sh- walking by is more likely to buy them. Where do you, you guys know, make your stuff at? Um, we work here, and my sister works at home. She has on their dining room, they like have a long nice. dining room table, and she gets like the bottom half of it for her card design. So she's been doing a lot of designing. <laughs> Leah from Booth 121 also tries to apply the value in the price of her own items she makes and sells, but she also talks about how it's still difficult to separate that from what you think people might say. She and her business partner, Rebecca, also talk about how consignment is a large portion of what they do. In the beginning, I sourced them from the craft shows that I did, and I had a network of ladies that I knew, and they referred on to the people that they knew. And then as the word got around, we now it's just people approaching us. Oh, and I did search on Etsy, local people that sold yeah. on Etsy, and I would tap into them. Right now, it's just word of mouth. Mm-hmm. We've kind of put a, a stop on letting any new vendors in just because it is just the two of us. We mm-hmm. got a little overwhelmed, and we mm-hmm. just need to take a step back and... We put a hold on it, but we still encourage people to submit their items, and we keep a file of them. Where do they submit them at? Either our Facebook or our Our email. email. You said when you first opened the place, it was mainly consignment, and they were people you knew Mm -hmm. around Mm -hmm. that point. Yeah, yeah, 16 vendors maybe. Really? And now we're over 100, 112 or something. I was expecting maybe we're going to add 10 more to that. thing I have to do is to come up with a price because there's always that humble side of me is are they going to look at it and go what the hell what the hell I'm not going to pay that for this item but then I do want to show the value in it it's just a a gut feeling and (laughs) it's really the hardest thing so Rebecca and I will I'll say what do you think Mm. what do you think I should charge for this and then she'll say well I think this and I said okay good that's what I was thinking And she I'll, sometimes undervalues herself. Yeah. Especially on like the more intricate pieces that she's not sure if someone's going to like as much. Mm-hmm. And it could be because I know that how much time she's spent on it. And like that, no way. That's, <laughs> that's way too low. That's a good thing to have. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. It's, it's hard to step away from it. Like you also want it to be successful, but at the same time, you're like, oh, that just seems arrogant if I do that. Yeah. Yes. Coming to Madison from out of town, Tammy from Hatch Art House searched for artists when she moved here. When I first opened up, I sought out artists, and that was a lot of fun. You know, I didn't have another job for six months before I opened up Hatch, because I had moved here, and then six months later, I opened up the shop. But So I spent that time searching and going to like Art Fair off the square, which is solely Wisconsin artists, and just doing a lot of searching, which was a blast. Mm. Uh, so now it's all submissions and the the artists submit their work, send me an email along with their bio and photos and prices and all the pertinent information that I would need to know. And then I look at their work and research it and just see if I think it would be a fit for our shop. And everything is, is uh, on, like I said, on consignment, and it's 50-50 split right down the middle. I am always willing to help an artist if they're not sure about how to price their work. You, you kind of start out at, like, we'll say $10 an hour or something like that. And then, of course, then you have to factor in the materials cost. And it's it's a kind of guesswork, too. Yeah. Um, you also have to figure out what the market is and how you don't want to price it too high. That's the huge mistake because if nobody ever buys your work because of the price you're never going to get anywhere but the artists definitely need to get paid properly it's always hard for artists to feel like they're not being recognized as somebody that should get paid for their work you may understand what i'm talking about Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) it, it can be frustrating that's something that's been coming up that never occurred to me a couple people have mentioned the artist should consider it like they're being paid hourly. And what they've noticed is most of them think of it by piece, but not thinking about the time you put into it. When people started saying that, I was like, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. It is your job. Even if it's not your full-time job, you're still working really hard at creating something. So you should just always make sure that you feel like you're getting what you deserve. And that energy also goes into your work. I feel, you know, if you're feeling you're getting the shaft, that's, 
is going to just taint everything that you you start painting or creating. Mm -hmm. But I think that we've we've got a a really good system here where the artists just they have their their set price, and if we will start at that price, and then we'll just see how they do selling the work and then if they start doing really well you know we can increase it a little bit and they'll get paid more and it works out for them when you decide to take somebody on how do you figure out where and how much of it goes in the shop it just depends on what their medium is yeah. so if it's a jeweler i just brought in a new jeweler because of the work that she was do doing with sterling silver and gold and things like that I wanted to have her work in a case so I asked her to bring in enough work to put in there and that worked out great but if it's a 2D artist somebody, a painter that well you can ask them to bring in five pieces but you have to look at the size of the work right, and right. so typically I'll ask them to bring in a variety of sizes so if you looked on the walls right now you'd see our featured artist who has some larger like three by three pieces and then some really small pieces and then some that fall right in between so mm -hmm. and that works out great because then the customer that is looking at their work has if they want something larger they have that choice and if but if they want something more affordable and smaller and they they can do that as well do you just kind of coordinate it by look throughout the store to make sure that it kind yeah, of I mean, flows that's where curating comes in mm -hmm. and it's like a puzzle yeah. you know you just <laughs> you just move things around a lot I do it section by section and every month we have a featured artist so there's always a lot of switching things around monthly for the most part Anastasia from Confectionique has been working with five other women for years they meet and have dinner and work on what goes into the market and they even travel to Paris together and she tells me about this really cool thing about how people are welcome to set up outside of her place during events. So I come in and I redo the shop, all the bones of it kind of. I put back together and bring in furniture and bring it out and hang stuff from the ceiling, do whatever other things come to mind. And then in the meantime, they are working on things related to that thing. So Thursday night, we'll have a potluck and we'll laugh and giggle and drink a little wine and eat and then we'll finish decorating mm -hmm. so they bring a lot of sparkle and pretties to the shop there yes we have a contract that you know that we ha take a certain percentage and they take the most of the percentage and our split is we get 40 and they get 60 and it's been like that for years and then on the Thursday night when we open all the girls come in and we all work that market together it's very busy there's a often people in the waiting room I mean yeah in the lounge area nice. waiting to get in and I can only fit comfortably 25 people at a time in here so you have to have like a doorman and everything <laughs> she's she's wonderful so we have we have punch and sometimes we'll have another vendor out there we have music and we just people are very patient about it they really, really? are yes 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 they that really again are. goes into the event driven mm -hmm. the event driven because any other time it would be like why am i standing out here yes, yes. and oh. they're, they're just so thoughtful and i'll often go out and thank them very much for waiting uh, i'll tell them i promise it'll be worth it because you can move around in the shop and see everything just like everyone else. I'll post an album the week before we open the Thursday night mm -hmm. and people know what they want and they, they know it's a one of a kind. They come and they'll wait hmm. until they can get into the shop and buy what, you know, what they love. It's very much a party atmosphere on Thursdays and I feel that these girls are such an integral part to confectionique success that I want them to share in it with me as much as possible. And mm -hmm. that's this whole idea that we decorate together, you know, with the finishing touches, that we potluck together, and that we're together again on that Thursday night. People do reach out to me oh, yeah. and they ask me, hey, you know, I just started learning, I, I just started designing cards. Mm -hmm. And do you think this would be something that your shop would be interested in? So then I might purchase outright things that, that definitely go with the shop. And then occasionally vendors will be out in the lobby. They'll contact me and they'll say, can I be a vendor? And so for the busiest markets, yeah, I'll let people set up a table Oh, set up like outside mm -hmm. or something. And I'll send them the information about what 
what we need in return. I don't charge them a thing to be out there. Really? No, because a lot of these folks are just starting out, and I know what that's like. And asking a person to pay me 50 or 100 bucks to be in the lobby just doesn't it's not going to make or break Confectionique. And it really will give them a chance to see what it's like to set up a table. They have to do their own payment system and package their goods. And and then I think the other thing I say is spend time with the customers in the waiting room because some of them are waiting <laughs> to get in. And then can you just spread the word about what we do? And that's really all I ask in return. It's very democratic of you. It's great. You know, I mean... Someone gave me an opportunity at the UW yeah. as a social worker, a fresh grad. Someone gave me an opportunity to have a booth in some market years ago. Someone gave me an opportunity to to have a lot of things. Oh, so I love that. John and his partner Stephanie from Mother Fool's Coffee House don't just have art on the walls. Mother Fool's also has live music and a mural on the side of the building that changes frequently. So how do they find the people that do this and what are they looking for? Okay, so there's three different types of art that happen here, primarily. So Art on the Wall is all booked by Stephanie. So people contact her via our website and she typically wants to look at something online. Some people don't have that, so they communicate with her and she'll have them arrange to bring by prints or slides or something. And as far as negotiating, there's not much that goes on. We have a really straightforward deal. We pay 90% to the artist and keep a 10% commission. Music booking is really similar. People contact me through the website. I listen usually online to what they're doing. My first level filter is, do I like it? Second level, how is it going to do here at Mother Fools? Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes I do book things that I'm not that into if I know that it's going to bring a great crowd in. Yeah. I feel like our role as a cultural space should be larger than my personal aesthetic. Although I want to involve that aesthetic, uh, especially on the more unusual things I like, I want to try to find an audience for things. So on the other end of the extreme, sometimes there's things I love, but I don't book because I don't want to bring someone into a space where I can't get them an audience. We'll often follow up with, let me know if you are playing around town, because I would like to check it out myself. Sometimes if I see something live, I can easier understand how it could work. Or if you play Madison a few more times and develop a fan base, get back in touch with me. I'm not not opposed to what you're doing. I just want it to work. Yeah. So the mural's outside. I mean, that's something oh, yeah. I've been seeing for years. First of all, when did that start and how? 2001. In the summer of 2001, uh, the alder for this neighborhood at that time, Judy Olson, called me up and wanted to put together a meeting with me and an artist. And I wasn't exactly sure what the concept was, but it turned out that both myself, Stephanie, the other owner, and this artist, Don Weddick, had all separately talked to Judy Olson, the alder, about wanting a permission wall. From our perspective, we said Mother Fools wouldn't do this. We can get it through the city and all this. So she called this meeting because this artist had contacted her separate from us and wanted to find a place to do this. So she thought this was a good match. It was. We had planned to do the first one in the second week of September, and this is in 2001. But then 9-11 happened. I was just going to say. So this is, um, this is interesting to me because part of our concept for this is that we would never jury it. We just wanted it to be the artist's expression. Because of 9-11, though, we called up the artist and asked him to switch his design because the original thing he had was really dark. It was like um, scary zombies with oil wells. And that's the only time we ever intervened artistically is we said it's just because of this. But he ended up doing um, a Statue of Liberty that's kind of like a troll. It was iconic. I felt like it was really important culturally in this neighborhood that that was there at that time. And we did that concept of this will give all the committee members a chance to see what we're talking about. I think it just created that groundswell of support that made it impossible for anyone to really object to it. How do people contact you for it nowadays? People walk in or they call or they email. And really? We, and we just give them the coordinator's numbers. There's um, two artists now that coordinate. Don was the first coordinator and then oh. he's moved out of town so there's two artists that do it. 
involved in something, and they're just the, they're the they're ones. They're just that, artists, and they love to paint that wall. They both painted it a bunch of times, and wow, they just take responsibility for that. And do you guys have to strip it down every time, or is it literally years of paint on that wall? It, every now and then, it comes off in sheets. <laughs> and the first time it happened, it was about an inch and a half thick, and it was coming off in these big things. I used to always make a joke, oh yeah, this is our program to get neighborhood kids to just put insulation on our building. <laughs> but then all of a sudden it was thick enough that it was actually probably insulating. Yeah. But you take those big sheets and they come off and a piece like this big as this table, you couldn't lift up. It's so heavy. And then you look at it from the side and you just see all that layer of color. It's yeah. really cool. Got a spreadsheet that we input the cost of all the ingredients. You know, the one that you made or one that you... I made it, yeah. You made it, okay. Yeah. All right. You put in a gallon of milk, you put in ah. your five-pound bag of espresso beans, yeah. and then it has a, a recipe formula for every drink we make that tells us what the actual cost is, and we figure out what percentage we have to put it at with our sales to get the, the staffing at the right level. See, now I liked John's idea of a recipe spreadsheet. It's kind of like what I was saying at the beginning of the show. Like if I wanted to make something, I could put in the materials in the spreadsheet I think I would need, and it would spit out the cost for me. I like that. At Pieces Unimagined, Kyle also keeps his eyes open for things that stand out to him. One person he found had stuff sitting out on the side of the road. Some I find, some find me. So right now we're at about 22 furniture creators, all local, all Wisconsin. I will find them maybe at a market. I will find them on the side of a road. That was one of them. Really? <laughs> Just like, yeah, the guy had a whole bunch of junk laying around. I'm like, I must know about this person. Mm-hmm. It turned out he was an artist. So I will stumble on. Word of mouth is big. Our vending process now has become more refined in that I really can't really chat with you, but we can go ahead and you send pictures in an email. <laughs> I will look at those at night when it's nice and quiet, Mm -hmm. and I'll get back to you. And then we talk about pricing. We had one rare one that is very successful. It's happened a couple times, but he just came in at just the right time, and he had stuff, and he wanted to sell it, and he was a nice guy. And I didn't think it was going to work. So if we're not sure on an artist, we'll start him with consignment. And then we give them like four to six weeks, and then... If they're successful, then we just buy outright. And we try to take the consignment off the table. That's not that's not who we are. And so yeah, that's a lot different than most places. It is, yeah. So we we pretty we're committed. And part of my job is to help artists get their stuff out there for real out there. Mm -hmm. And so I gotta be the guy who is the bearer of bad news and I gotta say, hey, if you want it out there you got to start low mm-hmm. and get some cleats is what I call it. Like uh. you got to get some traction and then you can start messing with your pricing. But for f- at first, get the stuff out there. Let's see people start talking about it. Help, let them brag about the good deal that they got on the item because in two years you're going to get better prices. Mm-hmm. And so that's our philosophy and that's just the way we work. One of our trademarks is when someone compliments the piece in your home that you're not like, Frick. <laughs> I paid so much money for that. I want I want them to be able to brag about what they paid for it, too. So you have to train some artists about that. Yeah. And so we walk them through that process. So going back to that guy who comes in off the street and he's just got his stuff right in his car, he puts it in, and it's selling within an hour. And then his big pieces sold over the weekend. And so we immediately just started buying from him. You just never know whose stuff is going to actually make it. I'm trying to think about what my time is worth. Listening back to all this, I mean, I make this show, I get to meet a lot of people, but I never consider my time. I'm not saying things should be worth more or less. If people want to enjoy them, they should. I go to an art gallery or a fair, and it's okay to look and not buy anything. You want people to look at it and enjoy it. I mean, I wouldn't put it behind a curtain and tell people, it'll be this much if you want to see what I do. I mean, I guess it's just being smart about it and find people that do want to pay for something. But I also think that it's okay for people just to pass by and say, I like that. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. 
The music in the show is by Romcom, and you can hear more at AmericanBandito.com slash music. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, so long. Mm-hmm.